This occasion is brought to you jointly by the Clement Center for National Security and the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. I'm Professor Bobby Chesney. I'm the director at the Strauss Center. Uh, for my part, there, there couldn't be a more relevant biography. I hold the James A. Baker III chair here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and the Strauss Center that I direct, it's named for Bob Strauss, who plays a recurring part in the story. Um, I want to welcome all of you, both on my own behalf and that of my friend and colleague, Dr. Will Inboden, Executive Director of the Clement Center. The Clement Center is named for Bill Clements, yet another legendary Texan who made his mark on the world and in Washington in much the same era. Dr. Inboden will take over the, the ceremonies when it comes time for the Q&A after the presentation from Peter and Susan. And towards that end, I will encourage all of you now to at any point from now or throughout the discussion to pose your questions using Zoom's Q&A function. And Will and I will be monitoring those and, and trying to uh, do the best to make sure as many as possible get posed during the Q&A. Um, now, for my part, my job is to be silent as quickly as possible. Let me do a very brief introduction that barely scratches the surface of the amazing accomplishments of our co-authors presenting today. Peter Baker is the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. He's the author of previous outstanding books, including another book he also co-wrote with Susan Glasser, The Kremlin Rising, and the book The Breach about the Clinton impeachment. And I could say much more, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there. Susan Glasser is a staff writer at The New Yorker. She writes the weekly letter from Trump's Washington. As I said, she's co-author with Peter of Kremlin Rising, endless other accomplishments like founding Politico magazine, being editor-in-chief of foreign policy. Um, we could go on all day, but we're here to hear from them, not from me. So let me just close by saying, these are journalists and authors of national stature at the peak of their craft, and they've brought us a really amazing definitive biography of a critical part of our history, James A. Baker. <laughs> Peter and Susan, the floor is yours. Well, gosh, thank you, Bobby, so much. And thank you, Will, both of you for having us. We are delighted to be with you. We only wish it were in person. I have to say, one of the things we were most looking forward to about this book tour was coming back to Austin in particular and spending some time there with our friends and with the city, which we have come to love an awful lot. Uh, as Washingtonians, one of the great joys of doing this book in the last seven years has been spending so much time in Texas, in Houston and Austin and Dallas and around the, around the state. Um, we will talk very long. We'll just open up the questions as fast as possible just to give a quick taste of the book for those who might or might not remember Jim Baker. I think in Texas, he's pretty well known to everybody, but sometimes the younger generation might, might have, uh, he might be more of a fading, phase, a fuzzy uh, uh, view. We decided to do this book because we thought, first of all, Jim Baker had a role in almost every major thing that happened in Washington from the end of the Watergate to the end of the Cold War. He really was instrumental in so many major changes in politics and in foreign affairs during that period. And it was stunning to us in 2013 when we got started on this book that nobody had ever done this before. You know, he was Secretary of State during a time when our world literally changed. The Soviet Union collapsed, Germany reunified, we had the first Gulf War changing the rules, the road of international order, the Madrid Peace Conference. All of that by itself would make for a pretty interesting book. In fact, other people have written uh, books like that. Jeff Engel, our friend at SMU, uh, has a book out on that, on that period. I think uh, I'm looking forward to Will Bowden's book that he's working on right now. We decided Baker's story actually is more interesting than just that because he also ran five presidential campaigns. So imagine Karl Rove and Henry Kissinger rolled into one, basically. He had his hand in so many different things. And we also thought his story told the story of Washington in a lot of ways, how things worked back then and how things have changed since then. You want to well, look, I think that's right. And, you know, we started this book seven years ago. Uh, you know, obviously, we're not going to get the land speed record for, for finishing <laughs> a project. But this was, you know, back in the, the dim recesses of the Obama era. Right? Remember that? But I, I think both Peter and I already felt that there, this was a moment uh, of real dysfunction in Washington. Uh, and it made us think that Baker uh, was a great subject, not only for telling his own remarkable story. Uh, and really there was never anyone before or since, at least in modern American politics, who assembled the record that he assembled of, uh, you know, essentially holding such a diverse array of, of top Washington roles and flourishing in them. But then it wasn't just a one man story, that it really was the story of Washington uh, and a study in power uh, as it was exercised uh, in this crucial period 
of the late Cold War. And, you know, that seemed like a period that, that was so far away from uh, the dysfunction and inward lookingness of our own moment. Uh, you know, Peter and I are both, you know, in a way, children of that 1989 generation. Uh, and our own son, uh, you know, it comes from a really different moment in time, you know, a, a time of American retrenchment and the 2008 financial crisis and, you know, the sort of division and, and dislocations of the Trump era. Whereas, you know, for us, 1989, we forget this, uh, was this incredible and even optimistic moment in, in uh, geopolitical history and in Washington. Right. It, it was a moment when it seemed that democracy and freedom really were on the march and trying to initially we thought, well, let's go back to that Washington and see, you know, what worked, what didn't, what it was like and what lessons there might be for Washington today. Uh, now, of course, it took on, I would say, uh, both a darker and a more urgent cast uh, over the course of our doing this book. Uh, uh, the rise of Trump becomes this sort of interesting uh, kind of theme and, and leap motif of our conversations with Baker as he struggles to come to terms with uh, the hostile takeover is what you know he and others think of it as uh, of this party by a president who doesn't really believe the same things and yet who might just be the logical extension of uh, the development of the modern GOP that Baker sees as his proud legacy. So, you know, I think for Peter and I, it really was a way of connecting uh, the present and the past, uh, and also looking at the past and, and understanding, uh, you know, are there things that worked in Washington before that could work again? Uh, you know, is that a moment in time that's definitively gone? And Jim Baker as a character, I must say, proved to be even more interesting to me than I had originally anticipated. Uh, you know, we're familiar with his dazzling resume, and uh, especially you in Texas uh, know well, uh, you know, what this particular Texan brought uh, to Washington and to the world stage. But I just, I don't think that I really understood the extent to which he really was not only sort of a zealot uh, of uh, uh, modern political history showing up in, in, in the middle of all these key uh, random events from the 2000 presidential election disputed recount in Florida to, uh, you know, the 1976 uh, Republican convention, which is the very last contested convention in American political history. Uh, so that was really, I think, an amazing experience for Peter and I, who spent decades as Washington journalists to be able to go back and revisit that. But it was also an immersion uh, in a story of Texas and the West and a political culture uh, that was very distant from all that. In fact, Jim Baker, as we learned only in doing this book, uh, for him, politics was actually a rebellion uh, and uh, a defiance of a family who saw itself as, as builders and pillars of Houston and whose family motto uh, ever since the Civil War was stay out of politics. Uh, and yet here's this guy who comes in what must be the world's most successful midlife career change doesn't even get to Washington until he's 45 years old. And then within one year, within one year, is running the presidential campaign of the incumbent president of the United States, Jerry Ford, from an obscure position at the Commerce Department. So I think just, you know, from the point of view of us as historians or amateur historians, at least, and journalists, a reminder of the accidents of history as well as its inevitability. Uh, you know, there were big forces at play in the end of the Cold War. Uh, Jim Baker and George H.W. Bush did not cause the Berlin Wall to fall, uh, but they shaped what happened next. Uh, and I think for Peter and I, it's really useful in our day-to-day -day jobs to remember uh, that history is not inevitable as it seems in hindsight, uh, and that individual actors played a key role uh, here. And Jim Baker uh, might have been in that sense, Tom Donilon actually, Barack Obama's uh, national security advisor. One time we told him we were working on this project and he said that he was really looking forward to it because he considered Jim Baker to be the most powerful unelected official since World War II uh, in the United States. And, you know, I think Peter and I ultimately came to agree with that conclusion. There's, there's much that's relevant today uh, to Baker's remarkable career in uh, sort of rising in politics and succeeding in an array of institutions. Uh, you know, you could kind of read this book even as a leadership handbook. 
And yet at the same time, it also, I think, was a marriage of man and moment. Uh, you know, that uh, was a time when Washington ran the world, uh, when the consequences uh, on the geopolitical stage were such that it did operate as a constraint on our uh, very fierce domestic uh, partisan fights and politics. Uh, those things are both gone today. America is no longer an unchallenged superpower, and our politics uh, no longer operate within the guardrails uh, that they did uh, in the time of Jim Baker. So, you know, again, I think it, it's just been an incredible experience for us uh, working on this book together. And yes, we are married. And yes, we're still talking to each other. So it is actually possible uh, to write a book with your spouse and, and come out of it uh, on the other end. But I will say that uh, there are 15 years in between uh, the first book that we wrote together and this one. But no, really, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful uh, privilege to have had a subject like Jim Baker. And I think for both Peter and I, what sealed the deal in doing this book actually was finding out that no one had ever written a biography of Jim Baker. And uh, we saw it as a unique opportunity uh, for us to do so, to tell a big story uh, about Washington and American politics too. So I really am looking forward to your questions. We're not gonna talk you to death. Uh, I hope you fire away some good ones at us today. And thank you so much for tuning in and sharing some of your time on a beautiful uh, fall afternoon with us. Great, well, thank you so much, uh, Pete, Peter and Susan. And uh, I, I think you heard this earlier from Bobby, but let me reiterate for our audience, as much as you're, you're learning about Jim Baker now, you're gonna learn more over the course of our discussion. The way to really learn about him is to buy and read the book. Um, and so we didn't pay them to say that, but we do encourage that. <laughs> okay, that's right. So, um, and Elizabeth is putting in the, uh, in the, in the chat box or the Q and A box, the, the, the Amazon link. So let me, um, let me toss my, my first question to you and Professor Chesney is going to have a, a question, question or two as well. And then we will uh, take some from the audience. Um, uh, and let me preface this, but I'm a very big fan of, of Jim Baker. I think he deserves all the accolades for, you know, a remarkable array of accomplishments. Um, but the knock that one will hear on him sometimes in some foreign policy and strategy circles is that he was more of a manager than a strategist, right? That he doesn't necessarily have the strategic vision that one would get with a Kissinger or even a George Schultz, um, but it's more about a, you know, a negotiator, a let's, let's find the deal, let's um, uh, tell me what the goal is, tell me the diplomatic hill to take and I will take it, so on and so forth. Um, First, um, and you, you, you touch on this sometimes in the book, but tell us more how much you think that that critique is fair or not. But let me ask you another thing. Do we overrate strategy? When you look at his accomplishments and you look at the state of the world today, maybe we need some more competent managers and implementers and negotiators than necessarily a lot of strategic visionaries uh, running, running around. Um, so maybe the very premise of the question is, is somewhat flawed. But, but love to hear your thoughts. I, I think it's a great question. In fact, it really does go to the heart of, of, of the nature of the job and the nature of the man, right? So if you were to think about the, the two secretaries of state that we talk about the most in the last 50 years or so, it would be Kissinger and Baker, right? And they're so different. In fact, we went to see Kissinger and he remarked on how different they were. He said, well, I'm a, he basically said, I'm a geopolitical strategist and he's not. Which is true. And I actually think that Baker wouldn't deny that. I think Baker agrees with that. He's not a geopolitical thinker in that sense. He wouldn't come up with some overarching vision for how the world should work. He is, I think, an engineer rather than an architect, right, to, to, to take your, your, your phrasing, in effect. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that there are that many who, uh, who were real visionaries. I mean, Kissinger, yes. Maybe you could say, you know, uh, Schultz. But I think most secretaries of state have actually been political actors who may have had some foreign policy bent like a John Kerry or a, you know, whatever, Rex Tillerson in his own way because he'd been an executive. The truth is none of them, I think, very few of them anyway, were Kissingerian in that sense. And I don't think you have to be a Kissinger to be successful. I think because Baker, you're, and what Susan says is right, Baker didn't make the Berlin Wall fall, he didn't make the Soviet Union collapse, but he took those forces of history and then he helped channel them in a direction that was useful for the United States and arguably for the world, right? To a, it wasn't inevitable that the Cold War end peacefully. It was inevitable that Germany reunify in a, in a, in a, in a more or less uh, happy way that, that made more or less people uh, uh, accept it. And, and those, I think, are the moments when you see, you know, a person like a baker come to the fore, somebody who's able to take the, he's not a revolutionary, but he will take the forces that he sees in front of him 
and try to find ways of harnessing them, channeling them, and, and bringing them to an end. Well, that's right. I mean, look, you talk about him as a manager. What do you need in a crisis? You need a crisis manager. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I'm sure a lot of people on this call would agree that uh, a little bit of sheer competence from our government might go a long way, uh, you know, and that competence uh, shouldn't be a partisan value uh, or an ideological uh, attribute. Uh, and that, uh, you know, so first of all, uh, nothing wrong with competence. And I do think if you had to actually ask me, you know, a gun to the head, what what is one uh, word that I would use to describe uh, Baker? It, sheer competence is, is probably would come out pretty quickly there. But to the, to the question of uh, managerialness, look, the crisis came to him and Bush at a moment when they were, you know, extremely well positioned uh, to deal with it. And in a crisis, you don't want an ideologue who has an inflexible view uh, uh, colored by uh, their own uh, definitions of what things should be. You know, you want somebody to see the world as it is. Now, you probably always want somebody to see the world as it is, but you particularly want somebody to see the world as it is in the middle of a chaotic, fast moving crisis. And so I think in that sense, you know, you're talking about a marriage of man and moment. Uh, a visionary uh, with the rest of the world relatively stable might come up with uh, the idea of an opening to China as a way of um, uh, pivoting uh, in the Cold War to a new phase, right? And that arguably is Kissinger's greatest achievement, uh, although, you know, whether you think that that was Nixon's idea or Kissinger's is an interesting debate in and of itself. Uh, but I do think that, you know, the end of the Cold War was not that moment. Uh, <laughs> where you wanted somebody who had an unyielding view uh, of uh, what should be. And I, I was struck by something that Margaret Tutwiler, Baker's really longtime, uh, not just aide, but you know, almost a Baker whisperer, said to us. And again, this is someone who's as close to him as any person in the world outside of his family. Uh, she said he's a ruthlessly unsentimental person, basically. Uh, absolutely, uh, you know, uh, she mean that in the best of ways. Not governed. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying yeah. is that you know not governed by sentiment uh, or impulse, uh, but you know really given to absolutely understanding the world as it is. And I think that's the key to understanding him both personally, uh, but to this conversation professionally and what he brought uh, to. Clearly, he had a lot of other skills as a natural diplomat that we could talk about as well. Let me ask a question about his years with Reagan and, and especially the transition that the book documents so well of, of his role as, as someone suspected by the long-term Reaganites as an outsider who wasn't a true believer, wasn't there for the cause. And then this sort of crowning moment, you conclude that part of the career by with Reagan's observation that he had really earned his spurs in this, notwithstanding the lack of sentimentality, this what must have been a meaningful moment when Reagan says, you, you are a Reaganite. And the question is, did he become a Reaganite over those years, or did the meaning of what it was to be a Reaganite actually change and shift towards the more pragmatic world that he, he represented? That's a great question and a great observation. You're right about that. And I think I, nobody else has picked up on what Reagan said, as you just did, when, when he uh, <laughs> when he basically says farewell to Baker at the end of his time as Secretary of Treasury, he says, you have been a, a Reaganite. And boy, that did mean a lot, I think, to Baker, because he'd been so uh, targeted again and again for being insufficiently committed to the cause. What Baker would tell you is, he, of course, he was committed to the cause. He just, he just wanted the cause to actually get done. He just didn't want to waste time on things that weren't going to get done. So, you know, did Reagan promise to get rid of the Department of Education in the campaign of 1980? Yeah, he did. Did Baker do anything about that? No, he didn't. Is that Baker not letting Reagan be Reagan? Or is that Baker saying, hey, why waste time on a proposal that a Democratic House is never going to pass? And instead, let's focus on what we can pass. What we can pass is Reagan's economic program, his tax cuts. We can pass, you know, uh, other, we can pass some budget cuts. We can pass some things that that Reagan actually, you know, defense spending increases. We can pass things that Reagan stands for, that are core to Reagan's beliefs, and not waste time on the fights that don't matter. So I think Baker, in effect, defined Reaganism, right? Reagan is the, is the overall thinker and overall, you know, visionary, if you will, but Baker then translates it into, into a reality. And, and that's, what, that's what Reagan meant. Reagan was a more pragmatic person, probably, than people thought he was. 
So when they complain, let Reagan be Reagan, they're taking shots at Baker. They're taking shots at Baker because they really don't want to take shots at Reagan, even though it's really Reagan who wants Baker to do what he's doing. Well, and I, I think this is really an important issue too, because it goes to what's so different about today. Uh, and it goes to what was Jim Baker and possibly for that matter, Ronald Reagan's definition of being a president about. It wasn't about being uh, you know, someone who gave speeches. It wasn't about somebody whose you know, greatest accomplishment was a tweet. It was about the idea that if you're the president of the United States, you actually have to do something. Uh, and I do think that the, de the very definition embedded in uh, Baker's handling of the role of Reagan's chief of staff was uh, the notion that Reaganism actually would be nothing and that Reagan would not be a president for the history books if he failed to accomplish anything, but simply talked a lot about it. Uh, that he didn't see uh, being a speech giver uh, as being uh, the, uh, the sum total of what uh, a presidency is about. And I do think that's a profound uh, uh, statement about what politics meant then and what it is now. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a question that in some ways follows up on the on the last two, drawing some of these themes together. And, and again, in our present political moment, there's a lot of, I think, appropriate lamentations about we're not valuing competence and expertise enough. And those often go together, competence and expertise. But one thing I really appreciate I'm very uh, about your book is you show that Baker is, of course, uber competent. You know, Susan, you even said that's, that's the, the word for him. But the interesting thing that you really highlight well is the three most significant positions he takes, White House Chief of Staff, Secretary of Treasury, and then Secretary of State. For each of those, he didn't bring much experience or expertise in. Like he becomes White House Chief of Staff, the most powerful unelected position in the government, after having served one year at the Commerce Department. <laughs> he becomes Secretary of the Treasury uh, without you know, any real knowledge of, uh, of economics, any background in, in finance or industry, the places you usually get Secretary of Treasury. Then he becomes Secretary of State without any real substantial diplomatic experience. And so he doesn't have the usual you know, life of expertise uh, that you would associate with those, those positions, but he has that competence. And so I'd just love to hear a little bit more on how did he actually learn the substance and the content of those positions? And then how did he perhaps tap the expertise of others serving under him for issues that he himself didn't have decades of, of expertise on? Right. Well, I think that's where you could say there's a kind of a leadership, uh, you know, uh, version of the, the Jim Baker book to do as well. Right, uh, because he's a classic example of somebody who was able to parachute into uh, large and even forbidding bureaucracies and find a way to navigate it at the very top. Uh, he was sharp elbowed and he certainly made uh, bureaucratic enemies within the system, uh, you know, at the State Department. Uh, the career foreign service did not love him to say the least at the Treasury Department. Same thing. Um, so he was sharp elbowed. But so I would say the big thing about Baker that applies probably to many uh, managers or leaders of large institutions was that he was a supremely self-confident person who was uh, more than willing to uh, bring in and in fact to really use uh, A plus people. A lot of times you'll have a strong leader but they're insecure and they, they, they won't uh, bring in good people because they want to be the brightest light in the room. They want to sound familiar. Uh, they want to be, you know, the smartest guy. They want to be, uh, you know, better than all the experts. That was not Jim Baker's way. Uh, he actually had what he called a plug-in team uh, that he took with him from the White House to the Treasury Department to the State Department. Uh, and these were all exceptionally talented people in their own right. Many of them knew much more. Uh, for example, Dick Darman, uh, who was probably the most gifted policy entrepreneur of his generation. Uh, you know, and he was crucial to Baker's success. He brought ideas and a framework of knowledge of how to work the levers of government that Baker did not have. Uh, but you know, you are right to spotlight this, Will. I mean, you know, imagine when we did our interviews, Peter can speak to this. You know, I was trying to, you know, the sort of inner uh, Soviet studies wonk, you know, in me was like trying to say like, well, what about, you know, at Princeton, did you, what was your background in the Soviet Union? You know, what, and I, I'm sort of asking all these questions and he finally says, well, you know, I had a tennis coach in Houston uh, who was a, a white Russian, you know, who had fled the, the revolution uh, and he was really close to me, like, like a second father. <laughs> I will tell, I just have one story. The, uh, uh, at the Treasury Department, he picks up the goal of rewriting the tax code, right? And Don Regan's Treasury Department had produced a plan for this that Baker adopts, or Baker inherits. 
And he looks at it and says, there's absolutely no way on earth this is gonna pass. And he basically tosses it in the trash can. And he gathers a team at, uh, you know, on Saturday mornings to sit there and redo a tax plan. And he puts his feet and his boots up on the table and he's chewing tobacco and spitting into the jar on the table. And what the people who were there recalled was that unlike the previous uh, process where people said, what would be the most ideal version of a tax code? Baker wasn't interested in that. He didn't get into that. He said, what can pass? If we do this thing you're suggesting, who would be for it and who would be against it? How does this work in reality? And they produce a plan that ultimately, you know, had to be adjusted, but eventually does pass. And that's Baker's gift. He's not going to tell you the best tax code. He's not going to give you a, a disquisition on the Treaty of Westphalia, but he will figure out how to get these things done. And that is a, is a, is a talent that is different than, than a, good, a good schooling in a subject area, but also necessary for success. Let me take us in a slightly different direction. As much as I'm dying to keep the focus on international affairs and, and the issues that all of us spend our professional lives engaging with, and, and the, the things that are actually probably the reasons why most of the people watching have tuned in, and, and I want to take it in the following different direction, to the, to the personal side of his life and his family experiences, because the book, I, th I think, clearly purposely weaves in, as any good biography would, but it, it feels very purposeful, and I'm curious if it is, how much you were setting up almost like a counter narrative, a counterpoint. He's having all these endless, amazing professional successes, but there are a lot of struggles and in, in sources of pain, lots of sources of pain in his family life and his personal life. And I just wanted to invite you both to reflect on this as a couple writing this book, <laughs> what you're what, what you felt might be going on beneath the surface, things that he didn't necessarily talk directly to you about, but insights you drew about. What, was this just a story of someone who seals off those two worlds and part of why he's finding so much success is because it's painful to look at some of the things he's dealing with at home? Or conversely, was a lot of his success in many ways stemming from, in some fashion from those personal things? You know, it's such a great and, and I think thoughtful question. Um, you know, that was, of course, the surprise of the book, right? You know, obviously, Peter and I embarked on the book because we knew of uh, Baker's dazzling accomplishments, and then he would enable us to tell a story of a Washington that no longer was, but might be relevant. What we didn't know, actually, was most of the personal stuff. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm always a, a lover of biographies and reader of biographies. And I, I tend to actually like the first part of the books better anyways, because that really is the part that, that I don't know much about. You know, who, who, who is this person? Where do they come from? What shapes them? Uh, and so for, for Peter and I, you know, look, Jim Baker is a man very much of the old school. He, you know, was fully cooperative with this book, I should say, uh, gave us enormous amount of access, full access to his papers, uh, hours and hours of interviews. Uh, although it's not, of course, an authorized book, but, you know, he's not a guy with a diary, you know, unlike Richard Holbrook and the wonderful George Packer biography of him called Our Man, which I highly recommend, uh, you know, but, you know, Holbrook was practically toting, you know, a personal historian around with him, a la David Petraeus, you know, and he's like, you know, writing down uh, in his early 20s what his intellectual sources of, you know, knowledge about the Vietnam War were. Uh, this is not needless to say, Jim Baker, right? So we did have that challenge as biographers. And yet, A, I would tell you, Peter and I found it really remarkable uh, that in his late 80s, mid and late 80s, which is when we were working on this book, uh, first of all, Baker is totally with it, but he was really forthcoming about this personal struggles and side of his life that we did not expect him to be, number one. Number two, uh, I think I, I at least, we'll see what Peter says, <laughs> came, came to understand, uh, you know, his, first of all, his political career almost as an act of rebellion uh, against his family and in particular against the, the sharp constraints uh, of his father and the world of duty and obligation as well as privilege that he came from. Uh, and it really was more than I imagined the burden of being James Addison Baker the third, it, by the way, he's actually the fourth James Addison Baker. And- They never really explained that. No, We spent didn't. seven years no. in the book, we haven't figured that out, why Absolutely. he's the third instead of the fourth. <laughs> That's right. And you know, his dad, uh, look, he told us, he's the one who told us, my dad, my friends and I called him the warden. 
Uh, you know, and I, of course, I thought, well, that's an aha moment, you know, from a man who's not given uh, to sort of armchair psychoanalysis. Uh, and uh, we found the documentary record that supported uh, the, the image of a father who was deeply controlling uh, to the extreme. Uh, we're, you know, we're talking uh, uh, to you all in Austin, the University of Texas, his father made him go. He was considering uh, after the Marines and after uh, going to Princeton, he wanted to be a lawyer like his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him. He thought about Harvard or some other East Coast place. His father insisted that he go to the University of Texas Law School. Not only that, and he said yes, not only that, but he insisted once he got there that he ought to pledge the exact same fraternity. And, you know, at this, Baker did protest. And he said, you know, look, I'm married. I'm in my 20s. I have a baby. Uh, I, I don't want to do that. But his father insisted and he went along with it. He was hazed by a freshman. And remember, this was the 1950s. This was, um, you know, not today's version of pledging a fraternity. This was some extreme stuff. And to me, that was a very telling moment. So then just, you know, quickly flash forward to your question, how did that shape him in this remarkable career, uh, you know, and then he suffers the tragedy of a, a first wife dying, uh, a very problematic uh, merger of two families with his second wife. Uh, it was sort of a Brady Bunch from hell, uh, as opposed to, you know, the TV version of the Brady Bunch. I would say that that's probably where he does have some, some real regrets, or at least sees himself as having transcended, uh, you know, and, and become his own person. Uh, perhaps in deciding to reject the family motto of stay out of politics, right? And so I think that's the narrative as he might tell it were he, you know, under some truth serum, I guess. I don't know. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, look, he's not a tortured soul, right? I mean, a biogra obviously a lot of biographies that are great are about people who are, you know, broken in some way psychologically or, or you know, uh, through their life's challenges or overcome this great adversity in that sense. Baker's not a tortured soul. He is a supremely confident person, but he did have a great deal of challenges in his personal life. And I think it's actually is revealing to see this person who seems so buttoned up, so perfectly quaffed and, and, and poised Control. and controlled in a public setting for decades on the public stage to know that at home, things were tough. He had a wife who died of cancer and it was a tragedy and he was left with four boys. He had, as Susan said, the marriage of his family to another family that didn't go so well at first. That was that was troubled. That was, you know, there were drugs. There were there was rebellion. There was, you know, acting out. And to know that somebody is dealing with that at home while still managing to perform on the public stage, I think is is revealing, even if it's not again like some sort of a tortured soul. Well, we are um, going to turn now to audience questions, and we've got a number of uh, audience questions in the Q&A box that Professor Chesney and I are going to be moderating and, and, and putting to you. But uh, audience, if you have uh, other questions you want to add, now's the time to get them in. And um, our first audience question is actually a perfect segue uh, or follow on to the question you just answered from Professor Chesney about um, Baker, Baker's personal life. And I'll preface it by saying it's really clear from the biography that the two most important women in his adult life are Margaret Tutwiler, his you know, very capable deputy, and of course his wife, his second wife, Susan. And so our first uh, audience question comes from the very distinguished Houstonian himself, George Clark. George, great to have you joining us today. And he asked, tell us more about the role that Susan Baker uh, played in making, shaping, influencing uh, her, her very public and accomplished husband. Yeah, you know, that is a great question. I mean, she was, by the way, I think the secret sauce in really helping us to understand Jim Baker. She was enormously uh, not only uh, cooperative, but helpful. And, and a number of the interviews we did with Baker uh, were with her as well. And that was great because, you know, often she would be a sort of corrective or truth teller. Uh, you know, like there's a one instance where she invited us uh, to their home in Houston. We had dinner with them. By the way, she's also an awesome cook uh, and uh, very impressive. Uh, you know, she basically had to raise these eight children that they had uh, more or less on, on her own. Uh, you know, she talks about having like four children in middle school at the exact same time at different schools. Uh, that is a nightmare for anyone, <laughs> never mind someone whose husband happens to be off running the country. Uh, but, you know, so she, we're having this uh, interview and we ask about uh, why did Baker not run for president? 
1996. Uh, he certainly considered it. Uh, and, uh, you know, he starts in on this sort of like, well, you know, I was tired after 12 years in office and, you know, I wasn't sure I could, I could raise the money, but I, and she just sort of cuts him off and she says, look, Jimmy, you know, you're not really remembering it right. The truth is, is that your party had left you, you know, they considered you to be too liberal. Uh, and she didn't mean liberal in an ideological sense, but this was the Gingrich era. This was a, you know, the new smash mouth uh, confrontational politics uh, had risen ascendant and, and Baker was seen as a representative of a different era, a country club Republican, literally uh, the old establishment. And, you know, the real answer is that he didn't run because he wouldn't have won. Uh, and so I think that's a great example of where, you know, imagine if she's playing that role in an interview with the biographers, I think she played that role that everybody in public life needs, which is that of a, a completely trusted confidant who was smart, who absorbed the information, but was most importantly willing to tell the truth and willing to call no bullshit, you know, on her husband, which is really important. And by the way, she did travel around the world with him. Uh, when he was Secretary of State, she was uh, going on many of the key trips with him, and I'm sure, uh, you know, was really a crucial counselor at those moments. We have another great question here from the audience. Uh, Mitchell Vernick raises a really interesting topic. Um, obviously, uh, the GOP has changed. It's, it, and, and indeed, the story of Baker shows you many glimpses of change over time. Uh, can you give us a, some summary insights into how Baker currently looks at what is happening with the GOP right now. Why has it gone in this populist direction? How does he feel about this? What's his own relationship with it? Yeah, no, that's a good question, in fact. And you could argue in some ways that the rise of Trump is a rejection of the republicanism as Baker had espoused. There was a, obviously a, a, a tide of resentment against elites and who is more elite than, than Jim Baker and George Bush and, and that era of people. And so the today Republicans don't look at Baker as their model. Uh, I mean, today's Republican voters maybe don't look at him as their model in the way that some of the professional class does. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think this is the, this is the, this is the, the rather extraordinary coda to his story and his evolution. Now he's very concerned about the party. He he sees the party as having drifted away from him. He thinks that, you know, he's in favor of internationalism. He's in favor of institutions. He's in favor of alliances. He's in favor of of American leadership in the world. You know, the, the sort of pullback that 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 Trump has has effectuated in in some ways, Obama did to a lesser extent in a different way, uh, goes against the grain of how Baker saw America's place, <clears throat> excuse me, on the international stage. Um, now, I doesn't mean he would necessarily have gone for every single agreement that Obama had put in place, but he didn't believe in ripping things down the way that Trump has. Uh, and, and, and I think that he particularly is upset at the treatment of the Germans, for instance, or our, our friends in, in, in France or around the world. He thinks that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, that these alliances are more important than the smaller issues that Trump is raising with them and then any issues that could be uh, dealt with should be dealt with in private if there are some. He he thinks the China uh, confrontation by Trump is probably not wrong. He may think he, he thinks he's going to doing it the wrong way, but he's come around to believe that their thinking about China probably wasn't right. That that when they thought that bringing China into the WTO would somehow reform China and make it more of a Westernized, uh, democratized kind of place, that that hasn't happened. So he actually has expressed some support for Trump's confrontation with China, although he doesn't think the way he's done it is the way he would do it. So I think that, uh, you know, I think he thinks the Republican Party, he's not, he's not a divisive guy. And too much of the Republican Party today, at least under Trump, is about looking for points of division, right? You know, against athletes for kneeling or against Mexicans for trying to come across the border or, you know, uh, you know this is sort of the, the politics of insults, the politics of, of division are just anathema to Baker. That's just not, again, he was a ruthless, tough partisan during election time. It's not that he was a softy, but he, did, he didn't believe in tearing the country apart, especially after the election was over. All right, our, um, our next question comes from Dr. Emily Whalen, who's a postdoctoral fellow here at the uh, University of Texas with the, with the, with the Clement Center. And um, she asked this more of a theoretical one. I think it's a really interesting question. Do you see Baker as more of a figure of continuity or change 
And then the second related part is, were there any moments of political transformation for him that you found? Any, any transformational moments for him as a, as a, as a political figure? Hmm. Well, so I think that actually is a great question because he's a product of political transformation, right? In fact, he's a product of the last great political shift before the moment that we're living in right now. Uh, and, you know, he grew up as a Southern Democrat at a time when everyone uh, that he knew in his world were Southern Democrats. Uh, although when we asked for his, you know, political memories of growing up, it was clear there weren't a lot except that his father passionately hated FDR uh, and saw him as somewhat of a class traitor, I guess. Uh, so they were already not voting Democratic at the national level in his family, even though they would identify themselves as, as Democrats. So Baker really is, you know, a, a, the literal manifestation of the Southern strategy of the Republican Party uh, in the, the 1960s that results in, uh, you know, the, the painting of the entire South uh, red uh, over time. And uh, he sees himself, by the way, he sees his legacy as being a builder of that version of the Republican Party. Uh, so, it, you know, it's interesting. He's not, again, he, because he doesn't speak about himself uh, or his career in, in ideological terms, it, it's hard to pinpoint any uh, aha moments for him. But I, look, when he went from being, you know, a successful uh, political operative uh, in the late 1970s, right? You know, that was like a career shift that he was calculating. He was tired of Houston. He was, uh, you know, bereft. He wasn't tired of Houston. He was tired of the law. He was bereft uh, at the death of his uh, wife. Uh, and he was ready for a change in his life, a significant yeah. change, including moving to Washington. Uh, he, but it was still a, a professional shift. You know, it was a, a career change. I think when he became Ronald Reagan's chief of staff uh, in, in 19... 80, 1981, uh, and recognized, especially uh, in the days after Reagan's assassination, uh, that while his, while his, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you can finish. If you no, like. sorry, I just, he's still, he's, you know, he survived. <laughs> yes, yes I, I am aware of that, but thank you. Um, you know, while uh, Reagan was in the hospital, it was really Jim Baker. Uh, you know, who consolidates power in this White House, who's the force of stability, and recognizes that although his friend George Bush at this point is the constitutional officer and is the vice president, uh, he himself is really a much more powerful figure in day-to-day is actually running the government of the United States. And I, I think that Jim Baker is a different person uh, from the one uh, even who ran Jerry Ford's campaign uh, in 1976, you know, and from that point on, uh, you know, is essentially operating at the heights uh, of American power at a time when, when the United States was operating at the height of, of global power. Let me ask a question that goes to this pivotal moment that unfolds as the book narrates with, with sort of stunning casualness, this, this quick decision to switch jobs uh, from the, the swap of chief of staff and treasury positions during the Reagan administration. Uh, so pivotal. I'm curious what you think would have happened if Treasury had not been so available in that way. Would he, have, he was burned out on being chief of staff. If he couldn't find a cabinet level position and if CIA was not going to be made available to him, would he have left, maybe left Washington, gone back to Houston? And then related to that, can you just comment a little bit about um, the significance of that switch, him not being chief of staff anymore in relation to Iran-Contra? I think that, uh, viewers would be interested in hearing about that. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think, I think you're right. I think he would have left as chief of staff at the end of the first term one way or the other. It was just, it was exhausting. He had gone too long. He had tried already to get out multiple times, become national security advisor or a baseball commissioner or any number of different possibilities, UN ambassador, CIA. And the Regan thing, Don Regan, who was a treasury secretary, suggested his jobs. That was a lifeline for him. Like finally he could get out of the staff job and become a principal, become a member of the cabinet. But I think you're right. If the cabinet hadn't been available to him, he might have still have decided to leave because I don't think he could have gone to a second term as chief of staff. And boy, history would have changed. But you're right, I think history changed because of the switch as well. And Nancy Reagan has said this, and Michael Deaver has said this, and other people have said this, that had Baker been chief of staff at that point, they really don't think Iran-Contra would have happened. They don't think that he would have allowed the shenanigans to have gone uh, uh, the way they did. 
Uh, and you can see that because, in fact, uh, you know, there are moments even during the first term where he's fighting with the, you know, the adventurism in Central America that is happening there. And he expresses skepticism about that. And, and there's even a meeting where they say, look, you know, Baker has said that if we do, if we do some of this, uh, th this thing with the, uh, uh, with the Iran-Contra thing, it'll end up being an uh, impeachable offense. So he was much more cautious. And I think there are a lot of people who think had he stayed there, that uh, Iran-Contra wouldn't have happened. Our, uh, our next question uh, concerns, um, in some ways, the, the method of your, of your research for this, this really fantastic combination of, of lots of interviews with Baker and many people who knew him, but as well as I know you, can, you consulted a lot of archives and, and old you know, contemporaneous journalistic accounts. And I, I, I will, won't talk about myself too much here, but I want to interject a personal observation since you mentioned the, you know, the work I'm doing on this uh, book on the Reagan administration, Foreign Policy, and your book is going to be really helpful for that. One thing I've been struck by in interviewing a lot of old Reagan hands is two, two things I should say. The first is for a number of them, I won't mention any names, the feelings and emotions are still pretty raw about some of the bureaucratic feuds they had, some of the fallout from Iran-Contra, uh, times when Reagan sided with their bureaucratic rival on a policy decision. Uh, it's amazing how 30, 40 years later, some of the stuff still really bubbles to the surface. But the other thing I've also been struck by is um, how so many of them now in hindsight want to understandably take credit for a lot of the Reagan administration's policy accomplishments, some of which they played a role in and others. The archival evidence shows actually you opposed that decision on the <laughs> INF Treaty and, and now you're saying it was a great idea. And, and you know, that's understandable as part of all this. So the, the question here is, um, how did you navigate the, the tension between interviews um, and the way people may misremember things or tell them other stories, and then some of the evidence you were finding from, from documents and archives from, from the time. Well, look, we were extremely lucky to have access uh, to so much uh, in terms of archives, including uh, at the time people had not gone through Baker's full archive at Princeton. Uh, you know, there are papers at, at uh, Rice at the Baker Institute as well. Uh, and those were super valuable in the sense that they were real time. Uh, for example, some of the internal feuds of the various campaigns that he was on, uh, having those memos there, uh, you know, that's really important because like, you know, when Peter went to see Dan Quayle uh, in, in uh, talk with him about a very contentious 1988 campaign and the subsequent presidency when Quayle was a major rival of Baker's uh, and Baker's initial hostility to Quayle never diminished. Uh, Quayle's own memoir is actually very uh, critical of Baker, but you know when Peter went to see him in person, he didn't want to talk about it, and you know he he glided over it. Same thing uh, with Barbara Bush, who you know of course loved Jim Baker, but there were cer several moments, uh, certainly uh, in his long history with the the Bushes, where there was real tension, and it was the historical record is ample to, to say that it was Barbara Bush who was particularly uh, upset, for example, with Baker and the 92 campaign and feeling that he was the invisible man, he wasn't really there for him. Same thing after 1980 campaign uh, when uh, Bush, uh, they saw Baker as having forced Bush out of the race uh, and possibly really, you know, done a number to get himself uh, into the Reagan inner circle as chief of staff. And yet, same thing, you know, she didn't want to go over that uh, in the interview uh, that she gave for this book. Um, so I would say having that documentary evidence from the archives is really important. The other thing that I, I particularly found in the parts that, that I was, you know, focusing on, there's a lot of great oral histories that were done uh, some time ago that are really invaluable with many of these players. Uh, Baker I, himself, I found to be a fantastic interview. I, he is amazing recall for someone in his 80s and now 90 years old, but he's told his story twice. Uh, and you know he has two memoirs of his own, uh, as well as innumerable interviews and the like. And, and he is a disciplined political operative who has his talking points. So he, he does tend to repeat things, I would say. He tells right. the same stories a lot. I would, I would add one story about that. In fact, when we went to Princeton to look at the archives the first time, we got a tip from an archivist yeah. who said, hey, the first thing you look at, look at the boxes of stuff from his own memoirs, which is a brilliant thought. It didn't even occur to me, but of course, because these boxes include, he's collected his entire life in these boxes. So that, for, by, just to start with, puts in one place a lot of documentary evidence that's gonna be useful to you as a, as a, biograph, a biographer. But then also interesting was, 
the, the evidence of what he took out, what he didn't put in the memoir, right? And what came out. And there were these memos we found where he's arguing with his staff, arguing with his speechwriter and aide, Andrew Carpendale, about what goes in, what doesn't go into his own memoir. And it, remi it reminds you, of course, this is a politician. And for him, a memoir isn't a history document so much as an argument for history, right? A political document. And there are these memos in, in which Andrew Carpendale, his, his speechwriter, passed away, unfortunately, uh, says, you know, you can't leave this stuff out. If you do, you will be excoriated in the New York Times book review, which will say that you did the same thing with your book that you did in office, which is to spin your, your, your story, the best, putting yourself at the center of everything and ignoring everything that you didn't want to talk about. And Baker took it in and they had a pretty big fight about it. We later discovered in doing some further reporting once we saw this documentary evidence, uh, but he went his own way. And sure enough, we looked at the New York Times book review and it almost said exactly what Andrew Carpendale predicted it would. So I thought that was very revealing. And so you're right, documents are super important in any book like this. The next question really plays to your mutual strengths in terms of knowledge of the Russians. Um, can you talk about what the Soviets made of Baker when they realized the role he'd be playing and, and whether and how that changed over time? Um, I'll just invite you to reflect on that. Well, speaking of, you know, the sort of uh, surprising history, uh, Baker's reputation uh, preceded him. And there's actually an amazing uh, uh, incident in the book that, uh, you know, of course, we didn't know anything about that wasn't previously uh, disclosed, in which Gorbachev uh, even accused Baker of being a leaker. Uh, which of, which was actually his major reputation in Washington. And Baker felt compelled to actually write to Gorbachev and to assure him that he had not been the source of, you know, whatever this uh, offending article was. Uh, but look, I think this is where Baker's unique act, asset as Secretary of State really came into play, right? He spoke for the president and no one questioned that, uh, you know, because he was more than just a regular friend of George Herbert Walker Bush's, you know, he was his best friend. Uh, and, you know, everyone understood that he uh, traveled the world uh, almost as a, a co-president in his own right, as certainly with uh, the unquestioned imprimatur of the president of the United States, which is crucial. We see it uh, now in its absence, right? Uh, in a world where no one can speak for the president, that creates an enormous set of uh, diplomatic problems and uh, challenges in, in doing the work of government. And so that was a key thing that the Soviets very quickly understood about Baker. The other thing I think is that Baker went out of his way uh, to build a unique kind of personal relationship with Edward Shevardnadze, who was uh, uh, Gorbachev's uh, foreign minister, but something more than his foreign minister. He was essentially Gorbachev's key ally uh, in the Politburo at a time when there was enormous hostility uh, uh, building inside the ranks, the upper ranks of the Soviet leadership. And, you know, they otherwise dominated by hardliners. Uh, it turned out that Shevardnadze and Gorbachev had been friends uh, for decades and, and essentially secret sympathizers uh, and critics of the, the communist project. Uh, and uh, so Baker, by building a relationship that was an actual relationship, uh, I can't say how much, how unprecedented this was. You know, Shevard Nadze's uh, predecessor as Soviet foreign minister was Andrei Gromyko, uh, known correctly as Mr. No, uh, from his time both at the United Nations and as a Soviet foreign minister. There was no possibility of a real personal relationship, but Baker invited Shevard Nadze early on in their tenure uh, to uh, a bonding, fishing trip and summit in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, the two of them, uh, you know, really connected on that trip in a way that, that made clear that Baker wanted something different than before. And he was rewarded essentially with a stream of the most high level intelligence, real time, that you could possibly imagine at this crucial moment, right? Shepard Nazi and later Gorbachev were actually personally confiding uh, in, in Baker about the troubles of the breaking up Soviet Union as it was happening in real time. And they probably thought that they could trust Baker in some sense more than some of the people who were surrounding them. Uh, so I, you know, to me, that uh, was a very significant uh, aspect of what he did as Secretary of State. All right, um, I'm going to put our, our next questions, uh, both, uh, again, both from uh, the, the audience. Uh, this is going to be a twofer, and there's a two very different questions, uh, one on policy and one on personal, but um, uh, it'll give you a chance to, to riff on either, either or both. Um, 
The first one concerns Baker's time as, as Secretary of the Treasury uh, and the tripling of the U.S. Um, federal debt and the, you know, the ballooning deficits in the Reagan years. Of course, between his time as Chief of Staff and Secretary of the Treasury, he certainly had a lot of uh, responsibility for those policies. And so um, how does he look back on that now is, is the question. Um, any, any, any regrets or does he feel like he was managing best he could? Uh, the second uh, question is very near and dear to the hearts of uh, a lot of us here in Texas. Um, tell us more about the role of hunting and fishing uh, in Baker's life, especially especially as, as retreats to his ranches. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'll take the second one first. No, you take the deficit one. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Go ahead. That's no, the no, first you question. the hunting one. Yeah. All right. Well, the deficit one, yeah, yeah look, that's obviously one of the, uh, the black marks on the, the Reagan uh, era. Uh, uh, record, no question about it, Baker plays a part in that. He was uh, instrumental in trying to convince Reagan, successfully convincing Reagan, to raise taxes after he lowers them. In other words, in the first term when they think that maybe in fact that they lower taxes a little too much, and while at the same time increasing spending dramatically on the, on, on the Pentagon, and the de and deficit is really ballooning, Baker, along with a few other aides, convinces uh, Reagan to have a course correction and to raise taxes again, not to get to the same level, but to at least get back some of the money in order to try to stabilize things. Uh, so that was an important aspect to him. But even today, he kind of regrets that. He kind of thinks that maybe that wasn't uh, uh, the right thing to do, that, the, that keeping the taxes lower was a better idea. He doesn't really express a lot of regret about it. Um, he does talk about today's, fiscal, what he calls today's fiscal debt bomb, because it's gotten so much even further than it had even in the days of Reagan when we thought the deficit was out of control. I mean, today we're just talking about a, a, a national debt that's about to uh, become equivalent to the entire size of the uh, United States economy next year. And he talks a lot about that as a, as a concern, but you're right. I think that's one of the, uh, the black marks on his record when he was in the White House chief staff. Hunting and fishing, fishing really are Jim Baker's favorite thing to do. You get the fun do. one. Uh, <laughs> and I'm glad we got that question because in fact, if you want to understand him, you know, like for example, we talk a lot about him as a deal maker and his ability to understand people. Uh, but, you know, I think the real insight is that he was, uh, an introvert who manages to also be very gifted in dealing with, uh, uh other people, right? Very insightful in dealing with other people. But in the end, we we were struck by the fact that he, where he seems happiest is in the outdoors. And even more than hunting, I would call him more of an outdoors person, uh, right? You know, he he definitely, he, he contracted uh, COVID-19, by the way. Uh, he and his wife did. Uh, luckily, they're both okay. He's amazingly <laughs> healthy and strong at age 90. But what did he do after he recovered from it? He went elk hunting in Wyoming with his son, and grandson. Uh, he likes to brag that he was both the youngest member and now he's the oldest member of the uh, Eagle Rock uh, Hunting uh, Club outside of Houston, uh, which was a very, I guess, august institution that was uh, uh, co-founded as many institutions were by his grandfather. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he loves the outdoors. Uh, his most favorite place, aside from Texas, of course, uh, you know, is Wyoming. And that goes all the way back to his childhood when his very stern father, I described him as the warden, probably the only time when he really was able to be close to his dad was on this remarkable uh, month-long fishing uh, and hunting trip that he took with his father uh, and people like the governor of Wyoming uh, when he was 14 years old. His dad even pulled him out of school for a month. Uh, and they, they went all over on horseback in Wyoming. Uh, and it's not an accident that many years later, uh, at the height of his time in Washington, he and his wife Susan, uh, in the summer of 1988, purchased uh, a ranch in Wyoming uh, that remains to this day, you know, sort of his go-to retreat. And actually, that's where he went uh, when he went uh, elk hunting just just a few weeks ago. Tell, tell them the bro cost room. Uh, well, yes. And also, if you want to understand, a lot of people, and we write in the book a lot about tennis playing, his other favorite sport. But uh, uh, which is one way of understanding the partnership between him and George Bush. They were actually doubles partners and, and winning doubles partners at the Houston Country Club. But the other way to understand him is as a hunter. And very briefly, there was a fantastic story that is not in the book, uh, but if there's, another, if there's another edition, I promise you we will find a way to shoehorn it in. But Tom Brokaw uh, appeared at a, a book event for us, and he has become a good personal friend of Jim Baker. And 
uh, he told this amazing story about um, when Benjamin Netanyahu uh, uh, was a deputy foreign minister of Israel at the time, Baker was secretary of state, and he wanted to figure out how do I deal with Baker. He asked Brokaw's advice. Brokaw took him to breakfast uh, and he said, okay, I'll tell you everything you need to know about Jim Baker. This man loves to hunt. And Netanyahu said, well, I, I'm from Philadelphia. You know, I, I don't know anything about hunting. Uh, and Brokaw said, well, he gets up at four o'clock in the morning. He puts on camouflage. He paints his face with makeup. He goes out. He sits completely still without moving for hours until he finds the animal and then he blows his brains out. That's what you need to know about Jim Baker. <laughs> So let me ask you guys uh, to, if, if you can say um, what you might write next, and maybe if you're not prepared to say that, you could instead say, if you had the time and you, and you might not be able to really do it, but who would you love to also explore the life of in similar fashion? Or failing that, who, who is it besides now that you've written the definitive work on James A. Baker III, who else needs to be written about in similar fashion that doesn't yet have that book? That's a good question. We actually do have another book on on tap at this point we're on tap to, uh, to write a book about the trump era trump is trump's washington uh, a different kind of book a different kind of book <laughs> right a different kind of washington um a different kind of player we'll know more about how that book will look in three weeks or so and we know you know what what this result's going to be is this a you know the end of the trump era or the big you know the beginning of a, a whole next chapter uh, but that's I, I love your question though who else needs to be biographized um i would have said until recently, I would have said Jimmy Carter had not been the subject of a significant enough biography. And Jonathan Alter, our good friend uh, who used to work at Newsweek, has just actually come out with a biography of, of, John, of, of Jimmy Carter. It came out the same day as ours. And I haven't read it yet. I'm really looking forward to it. But that, there's an example of somebody who I think had not yet gotten history's full treatment. Who else do you think is not yet of a modern era who, who needs a good biography? You know, that is a great question. I mean, you know, talking about great Texans, I mean, Bob Strauss, uh, yeah. you know, uh, is actually a very interesting figure in this Jim Baker book. Uh, and I think arguably is sort of a democratic equivalent in some ways uh, of Baker. Uh, certainly they cover a lot of the same mm -hmm. period in time. I think, I think it's a really, it's a really <laughs> good question. Uh, yeah. And well, think about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> please send us suggestions. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We are definitely, we'd like to do another big we ambitious it. project. I think for us, uh, you know, I know it's really unique to, to do something like this together, but one of the things that really was wonderful was having a sort of running conversation uh, over the last seven years between Peter and I about this, this sort of really important moment in history, right? You know, because Baker covers so much, we were able to really revisit uh, you know, this this span of time of, of the late Cold War together over a long period of time. And I think a biography invites you to do that in a way that we probably would really like to do that again, I would say. Well, you really hit it out of the park uh, with this one. Thank yeah. You. And you. so uh, I know our, our time is coming to a close here and we know you folks have a busy afternoon of uh, other appearances, but let me uh, remind our audience again, as soon as you click off Zoom, click onto Amazon and buy, buy your copy. Uh, you know, it's been a treat, of course, to, to hear uh, from Peter and Susan on uh, so much of the behind the scenes work and their insights from the book, but there's no substitute for getting your own copy and reading the thing itself. And it really, it really is fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, guys. You. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. This has been terrific. Thank you to everyone, everyone for coming. Thank Let, you. Send Will, us some Bobby, questions. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You guys are great. Thank you so much. We're going to do this again. We're going to come to Texas, hopefully maybe for the paperback or something when we're yeah, allowed yeah, to please come see us travel again. and we're able to do it again because we want to be with our Texas friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, you. we, we miss you guys. We owe you some stay. tacos and some barbecue. And we'll <laughs> combine sure. those tacos and barbecue when you're here. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, you everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.